some viruses cause horrible deadly diseases, so you really can't be surprised that they have a bad reputation. But other viruses also play an incredibly important role in the population dynamics of other microorganisms in nature. For example, viruses that target other bacteria are called bacteriophages. They look straight out of a sci-fi movie and they are everywhere. It blew my mind when I learned in class that if you were to just go to the ocean and grab a bottle of water filled from the ocean, there would be around 500 million bacteria in that bottle, but there would also be around 5 billion viruses. So here's a starter run with no viruses. Here you can see that the population first starts growing exponentially but then there's of course dips and other raises because as they multiply a lot there won't be enough food to go around so some of them will starve but then you know the cycle will continue since new food is constantly coming in and here towards the end we can also take a look at their genomes here the food detection radius gene as you can see is constantly increasing because as there's less food around the average distance to the food increases so the bacteria that can sense this far away food is more successful in multiplying and even though it's irrelevant in this simulation i think it's nice that i kept the viral resistance gene because as you can see see that since there are no viruses around there is really no point having a viral resistance so the average viral resistance of the population keeps constantly going down now let's talk about the viruses they aren't even considered alive and they have a very simple set of things they do they basically hang around when they are not inside the house and this will be based on their lifetime gene where a larger value means they'll be able to survive for a longer period of time outside the host if they come into contact with a potential host there's a chance that they'll successfully enter inside the host and this will be based on their entry success rate gene. Once inside, they'll start multiplying using the host resources and based on their trigger time gene, after some amount of time, they'll rupture the host and spread new viruses around. The more time spent inside the host means that when the host explodes, the more viruses will be spread around. And these new viruses will be spread around based on the eggs they push forth gene, where a larger value means the bacteria will be spread around further. Viruses will also mutate, by the way, and the rate of mutation will depend on the host's mutation parameters. So here is the very first run with the viruses and the bacteria together and as you can see with about you know 20 seconds all the bacteria has died. The viruses are currently way too powerful and I think it's because they have a very high chance of successful invasion and they also spread way too much. So I'm gonna tweak with the parameters to make sure it's a more balanced fight between them. Ideally I don't want viruses to be this like nuclear bomb that just infect bacteria and completely wipe them out instantly. That's not how it works in nature anyways. In nature it's more so like the viruses are out there but once the bacteria population goes out of control, since the bacteria is what the virus need, the virus will also start to multiply and keep the bacterial population in check. So I think in order to achieve this, we need to make sure that the virus can stay alive longer outside their host and they also have a lower chance of infection. So that the only way the virus population will explode is if the bacterial population explodes in the first place. So in order to do that, I made it so that the virus will have one-fifth the amount of chance to successfully infect a bacteria, but they also live five times as much outside their host. And as you you can see that with those changes it was a much more healthier run the bacteria wasn't instantly wiped out of the simulation and there was a much more interesting balance between their two populations here you can also see that the bacteria doesn't have the viral resistance gene yet but on the contrary the virus does have the infection rate gene and as you can see that it's a very important gene since the value constantly keeps climbing since a higher infection rate means that the virus is more successful in uh, infecting the host and multiplying the lifetime gene was slowly but consistently climbing so i think that's good the the trigger time gene I think will need some more help so in the next run we will talk about that but I think the most interesting one is the exit push force gene where it almost looks like a lower value was better which might be the case since maybe I set the value so high that the virus is being spread around outside of the simulation. I think the issue in the previous runs were that the trigger time wasn't really effective because the virus was spreading way too easily so the extra time spent in the host was wasted. So that's why now I changed it such that the value of the trigger time gene changes how many new viruses spawn quadratically and not linearly which means that the higher values will spawn much more bacteria than the lower ones and as you can see that in this run the trigger time gene clearly picked up in importance and I think the simulation looks good now since every gene is moving around and they have a purpose. Now in nature, just like how viruses can mutate to increase their chance of infecting a bacteria, it's always an arms race, meaning that the bacteria will also mutate to make sure their defenses are stronger against the viruses. So to replicate that, I added a new gene to the bacteria's genome, which is the viral resistance gene. And as you can see that it was quite effective, because even when the infection rate gene of the viruses were quite high, the viruses were completely wiped out. So to compensate for that, I increased the base amount of their infection chance. Here in this run, you can see that the bacteria actually got 
got wiped out, but the viral resistance gene was constantly climbing, so you can see that it was very useful against surviving the attack of the virus. Now, in real life, there is some things called retroviruses, which is not super realistic since none of the bacteriophages are actually retroviruses. That's not a terminology that's used, but a retrovirus just means that it's a virus that inserts its own genes to the host, which means it has the ability to change how the host works. For example, the viruses benefit from the host multiplying because they can only live and divide inside the host. So some viruses will actually make the host cells divide more. In fact, that's what warts are. You get these imperfections on your skin because the virus there is making your skin cells divide more uncontrollably, which is also why it might cause cancer. So let's think about how we can implement some retroviral abilities to our own simulation. We know that when the virus explodes the host, it wants to be near other bacteria so that the new virus can also infect them. So what if we make them such that if this virus infects the host, sometimes the bacteria will act like a zombie and instead of going towards food, it will go towards other bacteria. And not only that, it will chase other bacteria faster as well. This didn't really work, and I think it's because when the bacteria started chasing other ones instead of actually eating food, they were much more likely to run out of energy and die, which if you think about it is actually a bad thing for the virus because the virus needs the host to survive. So I decided to make this small change that I think makes the virus much more interesting. What if instead of making the bacteria chase other ones, we make this bacteria a good target to be chased by the normal ones? I think the idea is good, but it didn't quite work. And I think it's because there's so much food around that the chance that this bacterial bait is a good target was very low because the bacteria was just going around eating the regular food anyway. Anyways. So in order to increase their chances, I made it such that there is much less food that spawns, but each food gives that much more energy. So this way, the bacteria's survival rate will not change because there is less food, but it will change because they'll be tricked by this zombie bacteria. And it actually kind of worked as you can see. In fact, I think I pushed the number of food down so much that the bacteria wasn't able to divide as much, which in fact had a net negative effect on the virus, because like I said, the virus need the bacteria to be able to to survive. So now I actually doubled the amount of food which was actually beneficial towards the gene because now there was so much food around that the bacteria was able to successfully multiply but at the same time when there was no food around the zombie bacteria was a great target to attract other bacteria and infect them afterwards. This idea of viruses actually needing their host bacteria to flourish so that they can also infect, multiply and spread made me think about how I can explore this idea further. In nature, bacteria are very specific about what kinds of foods they can eat and actually gather energy from. So what if we made it such that this virus maybe has a gene that enables the host to be able to consume a new kind of food? So in this simulation, now I'll add a food too. And let's imagine the bacteria can normally not consume this food too for energy energy, but they can, if they're infected by this special kind of virus, it gives them the correct machinery to be able to digest this food. Now, at first, this didn't really work, and I think that was because the virus was multiplying and then killing the host so fast that the added benefit of being able to eat this extra food didn't really have a chance to show itself. So I made it such that the virus spreads much more slowly in the host bacteria. And I could see it happening, but it took a lot of time. And if you think about it, this makes sense, because these are not very direct effects where the bacteria just runs out of energy and die. We need it such that the virus can infect the host and the host is only around purple food. So they need to eat that and be able to survive as opposed to not surviving. So my point is, I think this gene was working, but it was not quite easy to see its effects on these graphs because it was such a secondhand effect that it actually took a lot of time to kick in. So you might remember the invasive bacteria from the previous video. In fact, if you're interested, you should check it out here. But invasive bacteria basically goes around and eats the regular bacteria instead of eating food. And so now I want to add them into the simulations. But first, just to get an understanding, let's have a run with no viruses, just invasive and regular bacteria. In this run, you can see that the invasive ones lost since there was only 5 invasive bacteria and 55 regular ones. I want to make it such that the invasive bacteria always wipe the regular bacteria out. So to start, I will start with equal amounts of invasive and regular bacteria. And you can see that they beat the regular bacteria to extinction every time. Now that we have established that regular bacteria have no chance of surviving, let's see if we can keep the invasive bacteria's population in check by using viruses. Now these viruses will be special and they will only target the invasive bacteria. You can see that here the invasive bacteria almost wiped out the regular ones but then they all died due to the virus infection. 
Now I have doubled the amount of bacteria so that we can actually have the simulation going before the viruses wipe out everyone. I hope you can appreciate that it's getting much harder to balance these simulations since now that there are many microbes that are running at the same time, there's many more things to balance. In fact, I have realized that due to the added pressure from the invasive bacteria, the regular ones already had a harder time to survive. So when I added the viruses on top of that, they had no chance of surviving. So I actually made the viruses overall less successful to balance this. Even with this balance, it looked like the bacteria were still having a very tough time, where you can see that both the regular and the invasive bacteria were getting wiped out by the viruses almost instantly. So in order to give the bacteria a little bit more of a boost, I made all their foods three times more effective. I think these set of parameters worked really well. Here in the beginning, we can see the battle between the invasive and the regular bacteria affecting each other's populations. But then as the number of bacteria shall be rise, now the viruses start kicking in for the regular bacteria especially and keeping their populations in check. In fact, in this run, the invasive bacteria was actually wiped out. But then I think there was still interesting things to understand from the simulation where there was a big battle between the regular bacteria and the viruses that targeted the regular bacteria. Even though we can't see them with our naked eyes, there's a crazy arms race that happens all around us all the time. And I hope that these simulations were able to help you appreciate that a little bit more. If you like this video, you should check out the previous two parts, where in the first part, I show how I made the simulation. And in the second part, we explore the population dynamics of bacteria with the addition of invasive ones. Thanks for watching.